if you could please be seated as soon as possible so that we can start ten past. So we'll start this uh, second talk of today uh, with a bit delay of ten minutes, but uh, and we can say, extend it to ten minutes after midday. Uh, or more, I mean, because I don't want to interrupt the nice discussions that we are having today. Uh, before Professor Almut starts, uh, just a quick announcement. People who are part of Neuromat, researchers, students, professors, uh, have to stay here at 2 p.m. To, for the uh, evaluation session. At, uh, at NUMEC, not here, but at NUMEC, at 2 sharp because we'll be evaluated by FAPESP for the entire afternoon. I'll say that in, in Portuguese, so that people who don't understand English can understand me. No, yeah, yeah, but, but I have to announce it in Portuguese as well. Todos os alunos, professores, doutores, uh, pesquisadores associados ao Neuromat, tá? meus alunos, alunos da Cláudia, alunos do Galvis, os alunos, né? convidados não, não são obrigados, mas os alunos que estão envolvidos com o Neuromat, Tem que participar, são convocados para participar da reunião às duas horas de avaliação do nosso projeto pela FAPESP lá no NUMEC. Tá? Às duas horas. Yeah, we can have lunch afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at two we meet there. Ok? Todo mundo entendeu? Everybody understood? Ok, so now without further ado, let's. Thank you. So, can you hear me well enough? Good? Ok. Well, first of all, many thanks to Antonio and Christoph for inviting me to this exciting conference. It's great to be here. Um, today, I, uh, this is the topic of today, quantitative and of tomorrow, <laughs> quantitative neuroanatomy as a tool to understand cortical function. Um, I, uh, in the meantime, I noticed that some people here know, know our book, <laughs> which Antonio mentioned in the beginning. And for those who We're might, oh, <laughs> so all of, if you have read this book, I um, do not tell much new today and tomorrow, um, but so you can relax. <laughs> and um, but tomorrow, uh, no, the two. Um, but oh, sorry, I have to learn. But uh, the next the. Third and fourth lecture will deal with cortico-cortical long-range connectivity, so things which did afterwards and which is certainly related a lot to the topic of this meeting. Okay, now, um, yeah, today I will only or mainly talk about methodological aspects. Um, let me start with some remarks, general remarks on neuroanatomy and on, uh, on connectivity based on my own biography. <laughs> um, when I studied biology, so I'm not a mathematician either, but when I studied biology, I intended first to go into behavioral research, but uh, during these studies, you, at a certain stage, you are for the first time confronted with electrophysiology and when I saw for the first time, real, with my own eyes and ears, spikes from a nerve, and that you can even influence the spiking of that nerve from outside, um, it was, uh, I was fascinated by the idea that it is obviously possible to investigate uh, not only behavior, but also the mechanisms behind behavior. So I knew that was my way to go, but I had a little problem. I was not very happy or I didn't feel quite at ease to work on live animals. So um, it was uh, an eye-opener to me when I came for the first time to the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics as a student, still just doing some practical work, and ended up in the group of Valentino Breitenberg, who showed me who was doing neuroanatomy and who and he showed me how much you can learn already from neuroanatomy on function 
so i knew this was my way to go and so i will talk about anatomy and functional aspects. now let me stay in these historical times and just a brief excursion to what was done at that time in that institute namely the whole Max Planck Institute in Tübingen for Biological Cybernetics at the time was investigating the visual system of the fly with this beautiful Omatidia 3000, about 3000 on each side and when you make a section through this you see that this regularity is also going on inside the brain so these are the length sections through the omatidia. Here are some fiber crossings and here is the first visual ganglion. And um, uh, what, a, what, what the, the nice thing about this is if you make a cut through such an omatidium orthogonally, you see that in each of them you have seven visual receptors. Each of them has a different visual axis. So the individual omatidium can resolve seven uh, different points. But when you look at neighboring omatidia, you see that, for example, if you take this receptor, you see that in each of the neighbors you have one receptor which looks at the same point, uh, at the same point in space. Now, um, when you look at the fiber crossing between the eye and the first visual ganglion, you see that there is a highly ordered system of fiber crossings. And the trick is that all the, uh, all the this visual receptors which look at the same point uh, in space are brought together in one cartridge of the visual first visual ganglion. And this is, the nice thing about this is that in this way the fly has a relatively high uh, resolution but also a relatively high sensitivity of light. So that was what was at the time investigated by Valentino Breidenberg and Kuno Kirschfeld and uh, showed me, uh, I, I say this here because uh, what we can learn from it is that there is um, there exist nervous systems which are absolutely specific on the level of synapses. So in this scheme, uh, if you have three neurons of type A1 and of type A2 and they are supposed to project onto neuron B, they know exactly, it's exactly predetermined how they are wired. However, what other systems are possible um, it is possible, thinkable, you know, that you have nervous systems which are not that specific, that they are specified only on the level of cell types. So type A is supposed to project on type B, but it is not necessarily predetermined which uh, neuron on, of B they project to. And finally, one can think of completely statistical connectivity with mixed cell types and uh, the connectivity is then determined by the proportion of types and by the connectivity, by the ramification patterns. Now, I would say all three kinds are, to a certain extent, realized in nature. So this we have seen is typical for the fly visual system. This, I would say, is realized in, for example, in the cerebellar cortex. Now, this in, in the cortex is certain, has certainly aspects of that, although we have, as we have seen just now from Audrey, um, in reality, the cortex is a mixture of these two. And um, yeah, we can come back to that later, to what extent it is more like that or more like that. Now let us come to the cortex. 
Um, cortex has a lot of functions, learning, thinking, perception, recognition, voluntary movements, language, categorization, calculating, composing, music, everything where one calls cognitive functions. However, when you look at the structure, it has a relatively homogeneous structure. There are cortical areas, but you need a specialist in most cases to, to distinguish them. Um, so our question was, um, what is the really, what is the basic structure, what is common to the, all these cortical areas and what can be understood as the basic network which is able to produce all these functions. And um, now, um, of course, the structure of the cortex is known since a long time, since beginning of last century. And uh, let me just show you some of the classical methods, which we then used later for quantification. Um, this is a nissel stain, which uh, where all, you see all neurons, all cell bodies, which are located in this section. This is a, here's the cortex, the surface of the cortex. Here you see the layers defined by the density and size of the neurons. So you see all neurons, but of course you have no idea from that how they interact or if they are connected or not. And then a uh, very important st classical stain is the Golgi stain. It's the same magnification as the picture before, so you can still imagine the density of neurons. But uh, for some reasons, not really understood reasons, only a few neurons are selected by the stain and stain, but then stain with all their ramifications. So this is a wonderful method to, to investigate cell types and ramification patterns. Um, you may know Ramon Icajal, who is still, his, who uh, at the beginning of last century defined uh, nearly most cell types on the basis of this stain. Uh, and the two volumes by Cajal are still the Bible for the neuroscience, for the neuroanatomists. Uh, then there is the myelin stain. Um, this is white matter. Here is the gray matter of the cortex. So here all the myelinated axons are stained. And this is also a way to define different cortical areas. This is from the human cortex. Um, and you see there are slight differences here in the, uh, if you see a stripe or if you see two stripes. And the most easy to recognize one is, the, is area V1. Now another nice stain is the so-called Bilchowski stain. You see that's a much, much higher magnification as the ones before. This stains all um, axons, not only the myelinated axons. And you see the enormous density of the network. You must imagine that you do not see in the stain the dendrites or the capillaries, or you only see the cell bodies in the background, the unstained, unstained cell bodies. And finally, electron microscopy. In electron microscopy, you see all what you see. This is a nucleus, part of a nucleus. All this is uh, cross or length sections of dendrites, axons, spines, glia processes. And particularly, you can see the synapses recognizable by the black postsynaptic thickening. This is a spine head. and this is the postsynaptic thickening. Here you see the synaptic vesicles, and there are many of them here in this, in this section. 
So in principle, you see everything, but it does not tell you anything about connectivity. Um, the point is one needs to bring together what you see in the different, with a different stain and our approach, and when I say our, I always, all what I'm going to tell today and tomorrow was done together with Valentino Breitenberg. Um, so what we did was to measure um, and count whatever you can measure and count on such sections um, to deduce other quantities from that and then to make conclusions on the properties of that network. Now today I will talk only about this part and tomorrow I will talk about the rest. Now what are methodological pro problems in quantitative neuroanatomy? One is to be sure that about the completeness of a stain about the unambiguous recognition of structures, uh, degree of shrinkage plays a role, and transformation of number per area into number per volume. I will not talk about this here. I will briefly talk about these two points and then a bit more on this one. Yeah, to be, um, first of all, when you count neurons, you need to know that the nissel stain stains all neurons, not all cells, not only cell body, not only neurons, but also glia cells. And um, in this particular case, they are easy to distinguish. These are neurons in layer five from the human cortex. They have, have characterized by a big Cell, uh, nucleus with a big nucleolus and a lot of cytoplasm around it. In contrast to that, you, it's easy to distinguish them the, from the oligodendra glia, which has only, is very dark and small and no cytoplasm around it. Astroglia is a bit more difficult, but also in this case easy. Uh, you have a light nucleus, but uh, and more speckled and no cytoplasm around it. But there are cases in which it is not so easy to distinguish these uh, distinguish neurons from astroglia. For example, in layer four, where, where you have smaller neurons, where you have not so much cytoplasm around it and where they also look a bit speckled. So just to say that it's still difficult to count neurons automatically by an automatic device because you uh, in, uh, you really need to be sure that you count neurons. Okay. Um, there are certainly uh, some labs have semi-automatic devices. We did it um, personally. <laughs> uh, Now, um, here, let me shortly say something about shrinkage. And for this, I will briefly say what are the various steps you do in histology. Um, fixation to begin with, which means that you keep the, the tissue as close as possible to the real, to the living situation. Then you have to harden the tissue somehow in order to be able to make thin sections. Uh, this is often done by embedding the tissue in some in paraffin, celloidine, or some synthetic resin, um, but you can also just freeze it. Uh, this means a lot of, means dehydration, and dehydration al always means shrinkage. Uh, then you cut this sub, uh, specimen, and then you can either mount the sections directly onto slides and stain them, or vice versa, you stain them and then mount them on slides. And uh, then you need again to do dehydration to, to cover the slides with some material which keeps, keeps them 
stable for a long time. Now, mo most shrinkage occurs here and here, but some changes can also happen in the other steps. Uh, what we did to control that was to um, make in an animal when it was perfused, so in the dead animal, before taking out the brain to make holes here and to see um, how the tissue changes in the different steps. And or then when you make blocks of the tissue, you see uh, this is, for example, a block of tissue before you, um, uh, before you Im embed it in paraffin and make the nissle stain, and you see there's an enormous degree of shrinkage. Here is a nissle stain on a frozen section that is less uh, problematic. Here is Golgi, uh, Golgi stain, and um, yeah, you see it depends a lot on the kind of uh, procedure. So um, here for our methods, uh, in nissle stain, after paraffin embedding, we had a linear shrinkage of that factor, which means that the volume shrinkage is quite considerable, below for 50%. When you do it on frozen sections or here in celloidine embedding, it's, it's less. You have nearly 70% of the volume. And interestingly, when you do electron microscopic uh, specimens with uh, staining with osmium, you have first a swelling of the tissue and then a shrinkage, and they compensa compensate each other, so um, in the end you have no change in volume. So you see it's important if you read uh, papers who do have contain quantitative data that there should be some remark in the methods about the shrinkage. And this is, I should say, no laboratory does it ex in exactly the same way. So um, uh, this may even differ in different laboratories. Okay, then, um, ah, I should say what makes it easier nowadays <laughs> is that I think most laboratories use freezing sections where you have not so much volume change. And whenever people use fluorescent dyes, or in most cases, uh, it's covered with a medium which is um, where you do not de dehydrate. So when you have, uh, true, <laughs> when you have used, uh, read papers which use fluorescent dyes, you can usually be confident that there is not so much change in volume or maybe no change. Now, um, transformation of number per area to number per volume. That's what is called stereology. Whole science behind it. Uh, many books about it. <laughs> uh, it's also used by, uh, by material scientists when they cut a stone and see some structure in the surface of the stone. Uh, they want to know what is the three-dimensional, uh, how, how, how does this behave in the third dimension. In histology, um, we do not have just a surface. We have a section thickness, so we do have some volume but uh, the thickness is often very thin, and so you have to, um, it's not always trivial how to transfer these numbers counted in a section onto a volume. Um, this plays a role in all of these, in most of these things, yeah, in all of these nearly, yeah, when you count cell bodies, synapses, or measure the length of dendrites or axons per neuron, or the density of axons per cubic millimeter, or the density of spines per dendritic length, or density of synapses along dendrites, or of synapses along axons, or probability of connections between neurons. Um, I will go through 
some of these uh, if, if there is enough time. In the last two points, I will in any case leave to tomorrow. <clears throat> okay, when you count cell bodies, the situation is like this. Um, uh, so it's so the cell bodies are usually the nuclei. It's the nu nuclei you count. So, so the idea is you want to know how many neurons you have in a cubic millimeter of cortex. Um, and uh, so you see this is the section thickness, about 10 to 30 micrometer in this case. And the neurons are not much smaller than that. So you cut many of them. And you, so you cannot just count them and assign them to the section thickness. Um, but you have to know something about their diameter and then you can, the number in the volume is the number you count in the sections per area times section thickness plus, plus two times the radius of these structures. That's the old Avocombi formula. Uh, the point is that neurons differ in size, so you cannot just measure one neuron and take the diameter. Um, there are a f several possibilities around that. If you man manage somehow to reduce a neuron to a point somehow, for example, if you only if you determine the center of each neuron by focusing the, through the section and include only those where you think uh, you have the center contained, that's one probability, but possibility, but it's right, quite tedious. You have to focus each, you have to scrutinize each neuron. Um, another possibility is to count only neurons where you see the nucleolus in the section. Um, one problem with this is that it's not always clear. Uh, it's not always so nicely one nucleolus. Sometimes you may have two or you may have a lump of chromatin and are not sure is it a nucleolus or not. Um, a nice and interesting method was used by Bock already in 1959. He used two alternating section thicknesses and counted, uh, yeah, he made thicker and thinner sections and uh, then he counted the number in the thick and the thin sections and said the volume, uh, number per volume is the number in the thick sections minus the number in the thin section and uh, per area um, times the thick section thickness minus the thin section thickness. <laughs> uh, the reasoning behind that was that you make the edge mistake you may make in both sections in a similar way. So when you subtract these, the neurons and the diameters from each other, you also subtract the mistake you make by counting all the neurons. Um, now we, well, we chose the Abercrombie version for, but we put a lot of thoughts into what, what we shall put here as, as the radius of the neurons. Um, so we call, counted all neurons in a section and we measured the diameters, no matter if it was, yeah, we measured all the diameters. And, uh, yeah, okay, I should mention here at this point, Günter Palm, our house mathematician at the time, um, he was involved a lot in all these quantitative studies, is now in the chair for neuroinformatics in, at the University of Ulm. And um, so he uh, was mainly dealing with this problem. Uh, so, of course, 
the diameter you measure in the section depends on the depth of the structure in the section and it depends in this way the diameter you measure depends on the depth of the how far the midpoint is from the section and you can get like this a relationship between the measured diameter and the real diameter and we ended up with this formula showing the relationship between the real diameter and the measured diameters. As you see there are two formulas, one contains explicitly the variance um, and uh, one is giving a little bit too low a value, one is giving a little bit too, too large a value and the reality is in between. So we used these uh, diameters for the Abercrombie formula and came up with a density of 9 times 10 to the 4 neurons per cubic millimeter in the mouse, in the cortex of the mouse. Yeah. Now, in case of synapses, the situation is more complicated because they are not spherical in shape. Um, here you see they are disks. What you count is when you see such a postsynaptic thickening, you know there is a synapse. And uh, uh, this can be like this, or it can be bent a bit like this, or it can even be interrupted. If you would cut orthogonal to this section, you would see the postsynaptic thickening is a ring or a disk. Um, and this causes the problem that if you want to apply this Abercrombie formula to it, you need not only um, the, the, the diameters you measure also depend on the, on the angle you have, uh, this disk has with the section. And the sections are always very thin in electron microscopy, something like 60 nanometer. They are always thinner than the synapses are. Also, um, you must consider that uh, synapses which, have, uh, which are orthogonal to the section um, are more easily contained, are more often contained in the sections when, while they have smaller angles. Okay, um, yeah, so, yeah, so with the, this shows how a synapse of that angle, the, the dependence of the measured diameters, how that depends on the angle with, uh, of the synapse. And um, so Günther Palm ended up again with these two formula, again one containing the variance explicitly, and again one of them being the upper and the lower bound and the real value in between. Okay, using this formula we ended up with a number of seven times 10 to the eight synapses per cubic millimeter in the cortex of the mouse. Uh, you had another number before? The, that the, the other number was the number of neurons per cubic millimeter, sorry. sorry. Uh, number of neurons and this the number of synapses. Yes, interrupt me if I, <laughs> it's not here. Um, I want to show you this nice paper here. Yes. So if I divide the number of synapses by the number of neurons, I get the 10 to the power of 4 we have been speaking about since yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah. About 8,000 um, in the mouse. In the, mo in the humans, more, but yeah, <laughs> ah, we, because we said 10 to the fourth yesterday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for humans, for humans, it's 10 to the fourth. But in, in mouse, it's about 8,000, yeah, that's what you... So you have 10 to the eight number of synapses, 
and you have 10 to the 4, well, there is a 9 in front of 7, okay, in number of neurons. So if I divide synapses by neurons, I get 10 to the 4. Um, what you, you ten so you, you if I if mm-hmm. I, so you wrote, you you said nine times ten to the four neurons by millimeter cube. Yeah. Uh, and ten to the seven times ten to the eight snaps by millimeter millimeter. Okay, yeah. So if I divide one by the other I have the more or less ten to the four. Yeah, more or less. Okay. More or less, yeah. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Um I want to show, this is a very nice paper um, by um, Beaulieu and Colonier and Beaulieu, uh, an empirical assessment of stereological formulae applied to the counting of synaptic disks in the cerebral cortex. Um, What they did was, uh, they did a very nice thing. They made uh, an aspic, a jelly, with carrot slices and tangerine rings and grapefruit rings. Uh, they measured exactly what they put in and then they made this uh, aspic and then they cut sections through it corresponding in thickness to those relative to so in the electron microscope, I mean at the magnification, corresponding magnification. So they knew exactly what they had put in. They made cut, and then they compared. Um, so that's what they put in here. Uh, things of polydispersed means they had different size of circular carrot slices, tangerine rings, grapefruit rings, and oval carrot slices, and here uh, circular carrot slices, which all had the same size. And this was the number they had put in. <laughs> And uh, then they compared four different methods. Not, not ours was not there then, but um, here you see uh, the result. Um, you see that it depends, the result, the quality of the result depends on, on the method, but also on, on the type of, uh, of food you look at. <laughs> For example, uh, this one here is very good with respect to carrot slices, circular carrot slices, but it's not so good with respect to grapefruit rinds. Uh, and the total range of error is between, I think this is the lowest, uh, minus 0.5%, so this comes very close to the real number. Uh, at the highest error, you have an error of 50%. Uh, which I think is still not so bad. I mean, 50, I mean, when you talk about orders of magnitude, 50% is not so terrible. But <laughs> anyhow, it's a, it's a nice, um, yeah, a nice approach. Interestingly, funnily, the best approach was given by the simplest formula. Um, well, they did not. In, they, they just included the number per area, and for the third dimension, they just took the measured, average, the measured average diameter, nothing else, and that was the best um, result. Now, we, of course, we used this to, to test our own results, and luckily, we were also, in most cases, below 10% away from the real value, except for, I think, the tangerine rings, there we were not so good. So, uh, of course, it depends on the shape, but I think we do not have so many. Uh, the tangerine rings were very strongly bent, and um, yeah, so we do have bent synapses in the cortex, but not so many so strongly bent synapses. <laughs> okay. Um, Now, ah, I want to mention this method, of course. Um, some clever man who called himself Stereo, he, it's, not, it's a pseudonym. I never, um, yeah, from Stereology, I never found out who he really is. Maybe somebody knows him here. No? <laughs> My suspicion is that it is Gunderson who used it a lot, but I'm not sure. 
uh, he used the dissector method for counting synapses. Uh, again, this makes it much, much easier in many respects. Um, what he did was to take two sections, adjacent sections, and he counted all synapses in this section which were not contained in the other section. So in this case, he would have only counted these two and assigned them to, to the volume uh, defined by this section thickness here. So what he did was to, to reduce the whole thing again to, to a point, um, which is, it's, it's a clever method, but it has also its problems, namely that you throw away all the synapses where you are 100% sure that it is synapses, <laughs> um, and you may have problems in being sure if you just scratch a synapse to be sure that it is a synapse. So um, you need at least another section to make sure that you that we, you, what you count is really synapses. So just to give you an idea about uh, problems and uh, many possible sources of errors in such measurements. Okay, now um, I will briefly talk about these points here. Um, what we did was to measure the length of dendrites or axons per neuron how do you do that? For this, we used Golgi preparations. Um, there you have two problems. Also that um, the sections in this case are quite thick, 80 micrometer, but this is still not much compared to the size of a dendritic or axonal tree, so the many cell processes will leave the section. Also, um, what you measure is only the projected lengths. You've, you, will, you see that many of the cell processes disappear in the depth of the section. So um, you could, in principle, solve that by focusing, but it's very tedious to focus in each case and, and look how much you have focused. So we, uh, we decided to just measure the, the projected length. Um, yeah, the Okay, uh, so, so you have to, to correct for the, for the cell processes which leave the section and for the fact that you measure only the projected length. And this was done in the following way. Um, so if, if this is a section and this is the section, we assumed that the neuron when it is a, a spherical uh, neuron, so not a pyramidal cell, but a sphere, more spherical neuron, we assume that uh, the neuron um, ramifies in a volume which has a diameter equal to the longest process within the section. Um, and in case of such a more elongated neuron, a pyramidal cell, um, uh, we assume that it has a cylindric shape. Uh, so we correct, we knew the, num uh, the length of processes in the section and then extrapolated to the rest volume. And then there is the problem of the projected length, which means then you look onto the section. Uh, let's say this is the dendrite or the, the dendrite. You measure in reality this length here and uh, the shortening depends on the angle, and uh, the shortening is uh, so 2 over pi. So we, oh yeah, that's another possibility to, to do both uh, corrections in one, uh, in one step. I, yeah, I will skip this. Yeah, well, here, here we assume that all, all the cell processes which leave the section have a length, equal to the longest one contained in the section and then one was uh, looking how, what would be the projected length. And you end up with these um, correction formulas. This is for, for the last type I showed where you do both steps in one, uh, both corrections in one step. Here, this is for the spherical uh, 
ramification patterns, and this is for the cylindrical ramification patterns. And we ended up with lengths of about 10 to 40 millimeter of axon per neuron. Uh, yes, yes, also. <laughs> okay, now um, density of axons per cubic millimeter, that's also an interesting measure. Um, you can do it either by taking the number of neurons, multiply it with the total number of axons per neuron, but uh, what we, also, what we did also was to take electron microscopic pictures to define for each element here as far as possible if it is a dendrite or a spine or an or a axon um, or, or a piece of um, glia cell. So we came up with the following proportions aerial proportions, so you have about 35% 35, 35 of the area is occupied by dendrites, a similar number of axons, spines 14%, glia processes 11%, extracellular space very little, 6%. So this is true for the real neuropeel, if you look in between, if you do not take into account space occupied by cell bodies or blood vessels. But if you take that also in account, the numbers are like this. About 11% are nerve cell bodies, 1% glia cell bodies, 4% blood vessels, and so 29% um, dendrites, axons, spines, 12% spines, 9% glia cell processes, 5% extracellular space. Now we said that if, under the assumption that all these processes have an equal uh, probability of orientation, we can transfer these numbers to percentage per volume. Um, so for axons, we would have 29% of, vo of the volume 29% uh, of the volume occupied by axons. Uh, then we, um, yeah, we looked for the average diameter of axons, and uh, which is in in the in the cortex very small in average, uh, about something 0.3 micrometer or even less. And we ended up with a volume of with about four kilometers of axon per cubic millimeter. If you use the other approach I mentioned, if you take the number of neurons times the total number of axon lengths, they may come up with a bit lower number. So the value is somewhere in between one and four kilometers per, uh, of axon per cubic millimeter. We have reasons to believe that it is more, uh, that it is closer to the upper bound. Um, now, density of spines per dendritic length, uh, very briefly only. Yeah, here you see what you see immediately is that you see only the spines which stick out at the side. You do not see the ones which are covered by the dendrite or which come up towards you. Uh, so you have also to make some uh, give some thought to, to the number of spines you don't see. So you see only here the dots are here the, the numbers you see along a dendrite, and then you have to make, get an, uh, uh, make take, give some thoughts to the question, uh, yeah, how long are the spines, what are the angles, and so on. And we came up with a number of that you have on pyramidal cells about one spine every one to two micrometer. And, yes. Could you please explain one slide before? One slide before? No, no. 
Yes. No, no, no. no. The, the one about one to four kilometers action. Yeah. Um, this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't understand exactly. The, the, so, so what do you mean? You have uh, one to four kilometers by millimeter cube of action. Y yes, by a cu in a cubic millimeter of cortex. Mm -hmm. You have several kilometers of axon. Okay. It's are you considering uh, all the axons or for each neuron you are considering the, the extent of the action? This is not well, clear. in this, uh, uh, it's all, all axon, you can't tell. Is it, is it coming oh. from the thalamus or okay. from axon the other hemisphere the or whatever? Okay. Um, Everything that passes axon, axon, through axon. this millimeter <laughs> and each. Yeah. That you Mm -hmm. Okay, for dendritic spines, we came up with a number of one spine every one to two micrometer. Maybe I should say, uh, spine on each spine there is one synapse. So uh, spines are located on pyramidal cells, uh, and not on non-pyramidal cells, and. Uh, each, on each spine you have one synapse, and on each spine you have one, it's one excitatory synapse. Very rarely you have two synapses on it, and then it is always one excitatory and one inhibitory. But to, but in general, most of the spines have one syn, all of them have one excitatory synapse. Um, so one should, you should also know that there are also synapses located directly on the dendrite, which you do not see, but the majority of synapses um, is located on spines in case of the pyramidal cells. Um, but last point, yeah. Spines show some behavioral change, doesn't they? I mean, they, they can change through life. The, uh, yeah, the, they. Um, there is some turnover of this uh, the spines in the neurons. It seems to be yes. Um, uh, um, I will maybe talk a bit more about it tomorrow. Um, there, spines differ very much in shape, and there is the big suspicion that this has something to do with plasticity, that they can become bigger or thinner. Um, there is also some evidence that new spines may appear in, uh, during long-term potentiation uh, or, or due, uh, depending on activity. This has been shown in slice cultures. I'm always a bit skeptical about this because slice cultures you take usually from young animals where you also, I mean, where you still have growth of st spines just by maturation, but uh, there are some papers which show convincingly that activity can play a role in getting spines. Um, I should say um, my first work on, in neurobiology was working on spines in guinea pigs, and guinea pigs are born with, with nearly all of their spines already in the cerebral cortex, so um, before, there was some suspicion that spines are produced while during learning may play a factor, but I mean, there are animals which are born with all, mostly all their spines without having had the chance of learn anything. So there is a lot of maturation uh, involved. Um, so the last point here is um, density of synapses along dendrites. This is in case of non-pyramidal cells. Non-pyramidal cells don't have spines, uh, already, uh, at least not in adult animals. And um, here, this is a special stain. This is an electron micrograph where we used phosphotungstic acid as a stain. Phosphotungstic acid is 
relatively um, selective for synapses. So you, what you see here, you see the synapses located directly on the dendrite. And uh, here again, that's a very thin section. You have also given some thought to the synapses you do not see in that case. Um, but we ended up with a number of about three synapses per micron along uh, dendrites of uh, non-pyramidal cells. Don't ask me which type, but <laughs> yeah, yes. So there's far fewer inhibitory cells than excitatory cells. Yes. But the excitatory cells have, have spines which contain only one synapse, whereas the uh, inhibitory cell seems to, seem to have dendrites that contain uh, uh, three synapses per micrometer of dendrites, so many more synapses. No, no, no. No, Am I, no I mean, no. I, I, I said on each spine you have a synapse and you have one spine every one to two micron on a pyramidal cell dendrite. So you have, the, the density is rather hi higher than lower. Ah. Um, okay. Um, so imagine all these spines you could, can imagine are synapses. Ah, so I was thinking about the whole thing as being the spine. Apparently that's not true. No, sorry. It's oh, the little sorry. things that, that are is the spines. A, that is a dendrite. Oh, that, that's a dendrite, always my problem. And, and Thank you. It's, there are less spines on it, and on each spine head you have a spine. Um, I have showed one electron micrograph before here. Here you see it in the electron micrograph. This this thing, this elongated thing here is a dendrite, and this is a dendrite from pyramidal cell, and this is a spine neck, and this is the head of the spine, and on the head of the spine you have this, uh, have a synapse here. Okay. So this is all, I think, what I, yeah, I think I will continue tomorrow with this last two points and then come to the conclusions about that. Um, yeah, thank you very much for today. <laughs>
I think one message which I wanted to bring through is that you should not deal with two exact numbers because, as I said, every laboratory does it in a bit of a different way. And then um, if, you, if you find a number by one laboratory and another and they differ by a factor of two, I would say this is more or less the same. For example, uh, you said 10 to the 11th neuron in the, monk, in the human cortex, or somebody who said it? <laughs> 10 to the 11th. Sorry? In the, uh, no, in the brain, sorry. 10 to the 11th in the brain. Um, the data I use are from Haug. I believe in Haug. And he says seven, to, seven times 10 to the 9th. Uh, to the to the tenth, sorry, seven times tenth to the tenth, but I would really not consider this as a really s significant difference. <laughs> yeah, um, variabil variability. No, well, also, in, I mean, you can you can make. I would say a variability bit between authors. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something. In Brazil, there is a famous neurobiologist who has a famous book which was named uh, 100, 100 billion neurons. And then 100 what? billion neurons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, uh, a, a younger researcher who mm -hmm. was his student, mm -hmm. she counted them. She, she, she did something like you, uh, the Canadian people. They put in a mix and they counted them. Yeah, and I, then I, I, he I, said, well, I was wrong. It is 86, 86, 86, 86 billion. Could you please comment on this instead figures? Of, instead of 100 yeah. billion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is... Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I know her. She, I like her. I think she does good work. <laughs> I, um, I tend to believe her. And don't fight between, I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's, I mean, you know, what, uh, I mean, what is, what is great is if you have very, uh, what we always liked, if you have very different approaches and they are not, they certainly do not come up with the same number, it's clear, but if, if, it's, if it's not too big a difference, I mean, she, she used a really very different method and came up with nearly 100,000, <laughs> I mean, with 86 million. Uh, billions. I think for using two very different methods, that's uh, that's not too uh, too bad. It's what is the other figure you, you mentioned? Ten to the uh, the one you, you uh, t uh, in the human cortex, seven, seven times ten to the tenth. Ten to the tenth. So uh, with respect to. to But you, um, you can continue saying 10 to the 11th. <laughs> yes, in the, yeah. Uh, but it also, for example, it showed with these diff very different methods, we came up with 1 to 4 kilometers per cubic millimeter of axon. Um, uh, in view of the fact that it's two really very different methods, um, it's not too bad. I mean, it must be between one and four kilometers, but we had other methods to convince us that it is rather the higher value which is correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to know if the number yeah. of connections neuron depends mm -hmm. on the number of neurons. So you've got one type of, uh, of neuron one extra uh, in that case, neuron. we mixed everything together. In, oh, sorry, yeah. S yeah, so you've got this type of neuron, and um, f 
for different species, maybe you have different uh, number of neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. Does the number of connections of this type of neuron changes with n, with the number of neurons? Yes. Um, yeah, we. It is possible to. Uh, I don't have the, here um, to look how this differs with brain size. I mm. mean, mouse versus human. Uh, the main difference is that in big brains you have lower densities of neurons, which means, but, but you have similar density of synapses, which means yet that you have in average more synapses per neuron in a larger brain, okay. uh, which means that the cell processes are in average longer. The individual neuron makes in average more processes in a larger brain. Sorry? No, no, no. <laughs> no, on the contrary. Uh, well, when we think that the cortex is an associative device, it is good if one neuron has very many connections. It knows what is happening in other parts of the brain. Uh, um, we will come to that tomorrow. It's more like a small world network. So yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. is there any function of that? Someone derived a function. Number of, uh, of connection is a function of the number of neurons. Because that's what we do in random graphs. We, we would have the number of neurons, n. Yeah. Then we would make some rules for the connections. And the rules for the connections would depend on n on the number of neurons, uh -huh. and we would send n to a very large number. And if you say that it's 10 to the 4 times n, mm -hmm. is different than if you say it's n squared. Because it would behave very in a very different way if we send n to infinity. So that's that was the aim of my question. Is there any one who did that work? Uh, there is some data. I did not that's fully grasp the question. Ah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I think this is yeah. a question for tomorrow. I think it would be yeah. related to the probability yeah, of maybe. connections between <laughs> two pairs, two, two neurons, and this would depend mm -hmm. also on the distance. But I think this is for tomorrow, as far as I understood. I'm sorry. I'm not. Uh, I'm a computer science, so I don't know anything yeah, about yeah. anatomy. But uh, those, that number that you gave is the number of neurons in the cortex or in the whole in, brain? In the, co the whole brain. In the, uh, in the well, what I mean, we talked about, the 10 to the 11th versus 7 times 10 to the 10th, that is in the human brain. In the human brain. Including cerebellum yeah, and yeah, whatever everything, part. Everything. 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 But what I said before, the number of neurons per cubic millimeter, that was in the mouse. Okay. Uh, what did I say? Nine times ten to the fourth, also per cubic millimeter. That would be about half of that also in, the, in a larger no, brain, in a human. And, and um, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, how, what percentage of those uh, ten to the eleven... Uh, neurons are in cerebellum, hippocampus, uh, good cortex, question. whatever. Good question, because um, most of them, <laughs> most of them are in the cerebellum. <laughs> if I go back to the numbers by Haug, um, which I take the seven times, ten to the ninth, no, sorry, ten, ten, ten to the tenth in the whole human brain, according to him, um, Five times ten to the tenth are located in the cerebellum, and only one point five times ten to the tenth in the cortex. So, so in the cerebellum you have more neurons than in the cortex. Which, yeah, in spite of the fact, in spite of the fact that the volume of the cortex is considerably larger. But in the cerebellum, you have many very small neurons with a higher packing density. So uh, returning to the area and, and, and uh, number and 
uh, a number of cells and how they ramify. So in the human brain, uh, we have seen this, we have actually experimental data on that. Uh, in a population of about 900 subjects, the largest brain has an area, surface area, of about 200,000 square millimeters, mm -hmm. whereas the smallest brain, adult or everybody adult, the smallest has about 1. Uh, 110 thousand so mm -hmm. it's almost twice as large mm -hmm. within adults people who are uh, absolutely normal clinically healthy you can have brains that are just in terms of surface area mm -hmm. twice as large what is going on there at the cellular level more neurons more spread neurons uh, more dendrites more ramifications and by the way the thickness is roughly the same it's really the area that changes to my knowledge, uh, maybe Audrey has some, knows some of that too. To my knowledge, it is um, not a difference in number of neurons. It's rather a difference in the cell processes. Um, some say also in glia cells. So I mean, there is that. I mean, it's always said women have smaller brains than men, which in average seems to be true. <laughs> but to my, uh, but it seems that the number of neurons is not different. Would you say that too? <laughs> no, in normal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Square millimeters and uh, the largest about 200,000 millimeters. So it's about twice the size. And they're clinically, clinically the same. Even in this room here, probably we may, we may well find differences that can be about mm -hmm. uh, uh, 1.8 uh, by a factor, if not oh. two, 1.8 or something like this. So the question is, what is going on in the cortex? Is it more glial cells, uh, glial cells or more neurons or the neurons are more ramified, different processes? Myelin, perhaps more myelin is there. I, I don't to know. my knowledge, the density of neurons would be lower in the big brains. Um, um, yeah, which means that they would have more cell processes and or more glia. Maybe more myelination could be. In, in the mouse, the morphology is completely different. So if you look at dendrites, you will have more like packed um, uh, neurons and the dendrites are, are really just um, um, making angles. Like, so it seems that the neuron will change, the shape of the neurons will change depending on, on the, uh, the type of the brain. If we, like if we make another metaphor and we look at the weights of people also in this room, there might easily be a factor one and a half or even two in between the heaviest and the, the lightest person, so. Ah, well, we can see. Yeah, I was just repeating the microphone. So uh, in that case, we more or less know, at least I, I, I believe I know what's going on. So you have people who do more weightlifting, for instance, so they have more muscles, or they eat more, or whatever, they are fat, they are, without no, no offense for whatever, but they may have more adipocytes, or adipocytes accumulating more lipids, so we, we more or less know what's going on, the different constitution itself. Um, but in fact, if you look at a histology or a pathology uh, textbook, it's very rare to see, for any tissue, not just brain, it's very rare to see mentions about the distances between cells. Say you're studying pathology of bone, you don't see much comments about, okay, if you have a bigger femur, femur a bigger bone, therefore your, the cells are more separated. No, you actually have more cells. Likewise for the heart. Well, the heart can go hypertrophy. Uh, uh, but generally, the, the, it's the, well, now thinking here, muscles actually, the, the cells grow because they accumulate more fibers. So it may really depend on, on the type of tissue. But for the neurons, I, I really don't know. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why. So my guess at present is, or my thinking that the number of neurons is relatively constant in big and small brains within one species, I mean within humans. <laughs> number. The implication of this then would be that the number of cells per cubic millimeter, that changes according yeah, to the size, yeah, right? Yeah, Bigger brain, it's yeah. the density is smaller, yeah. they are more verified yeah, and I more packed otherwise. All right. 
Yes, that's what so, I... Yeah. Thank you. I, I think my question is in this line. If the density uh, number of neurons per volume can change, maybe if we look to the volume of the neurons occupying the total volume will be the same, isn't it? Ah, the volume. Yeah, you're right. I'm, you're right, yeah. The, um, my guess is also that in larger brains, the volume of the neurons is larger. So if we look to the volume occupied by the neurons and divide by the volume of the brain, this could be a constant true. Yes, um, I say yes, until somebody comes with counter evidence. But <laughs> to all what I until know until now, I say, I say yes. <laughs> I think this is a good point for us to start for today because we have a meeting at 2. It's already half past 12, so let us. Thank you.